The idea and design is often to take as steady and timeless an approach as possible. Often the objective is to make a thing as appealing as it can be for as long as it can be. But from the historic perspective, I've seen that everything is a product of its time. And to survive, it gets modified, or attitudes around it shift, or the design dies and fades away. So what I've learned from studying the staying power of design and architecture is that everything changes and nothing stays the same. Which sounds like an obvious trope when you think about the stories of humans, but I found it shocking the degree to which, over the course of time, the objects and designs put out into the world take on new lives as they get reused and repurposed. And this is actually a phenomenon that architectural historians call iconographical drift, this change over time. And my favorite example of iconographical drift is this shape. It's called a quatrefoil, and it's appeared in many forms over time. Today, you can see it everywhere. Here's some examples I found all around San Francisco and Oakland and Berkeley. It's on a trash can. It's carved into buildings and windows. And here it is in the facade of the Reims Cathedral in France. But you also see it in revival Gothic architecture in the National Cathedral in DC, the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York. And it's also in mission churches and mission-style homes all around California. So what's its deal? What's up, what's up with this shape? That organic shape has its origins in Spain and the Middle East because of the great Islamic mathematicians. Here it is in the fountain of the Alhambra in Granada. A whole lot of Ottoman mosques were actually quatrefoil shaped, like the whole thing was shaped like a quatrefoil. Uh, here it is in the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. And it's used in all these buildings because Moorish architecture really liked to use complicated shapes. And like the quatrefoil looks simple, but if you think about it, you really need a compass and some tools to make it, because making a circle is hard, but making four evenly spaced interconnected circles is actually really hard. And so it became this kind of fancy shape, because it requires a, a large amount of mathematical skill to actually make. So it's only in beautiful, important buildings that can afford the skilled labor to make it. This, this is a shape that says, hey, this is a fancy building. And then the shape travels along the Silk Road and into Europe, and the fancy element of it remains. So here it is in the Lincoln Cathedral in the UK. And then once it gets in, involved in the church, then meaning gets ascribed to it. All you have to do is think within the Christian tradition. It can kind of look like a cross. It can kind of represent the four evangelists. Then after it enters the church, then Christian meaning gets assigned to it. But you also see it on secular buildings like the Doge's Palace in Venice, and in secular buildings now, like the Chicago Athletic Association building, which is clearly modeled directly on the Doge's Palace. And not to mention, now it's drifted onto those trash cans and windows all around San Francisco and Oakland and Berkeley. Uh, the shape embodies a sense of vague, exotic luxury, which is why fashion houses are clamoring to claim it. Louis Vuitton had a lawsuit over it. David Yerman trademarked the word quatrefoil. Van Cleef and Arpels is fiercely litigious over its ownership of this shape. So the quatrefoil wasn't designed by anyone. Rather, it's used by designers to decorate or organize their products. It just happens to be particularly susceptible to new meanings and new contexts. It's like the tofu of ornamental design. It can mean anything. And designers didn't plan this drift. Designers were part of the drift. They brought it to new places, gave it new meanings. And so the quatrefoil is an interesting case study about how drift happens. But when drift happens, sometimes there are practical implications. It's not always like symbol gets shuffled around until it's meaningless. Um, maybe some corporation will take on the quatrefoil and give it a new meaning as a logo or a shorthand or something. Uh, drift can bring certain objects to the fore and turn them from decoration to tool, like with this. So, Hashtags help people gather, they help movements form, they help products sell. We see it all around us in front of our words. And its modern usage, the modern usage as we know it, began in 2007 with one tweet. This is the first tweet. It says, how do you feel about using pound for groups, as in hashtag bar camp? Um, and this guy named Chris Messina, uh, invented the hashtag because he went to this nerdy convention called Bar Camp and wanted to make sure that everyone that was at the convention could meet and talk about it. So he decided, he posed this question to the group, could we use this thing to tag our words? 
Um, so he didn't invent this symbol. There was other stuff before him, which we'll talk about, but he was using it in this new way. He was putting pound symbols in front of his words, and people were like, what are you doing? It looks really dumb. Uh, but it worked for bar camp, but that's kind of like a niche nerdy thing. It really caught on a few months later when uh, Chris had a friend who was covering a fire in San Diego, and he was tweeting live about the spread of the fire and saying at the end of each of his tweets, San Diego fire. And Chris sent him a message and said, hey, what if you put a, hash, a pound sign in front of your word and make it one, one phrase, hashtag San Diego fire. Um, and this turned into a successful shorthand and allowed other people to follow it. And it made other people uh, catch on, like, hey, what is this hashtag thing? It's working for, for journalism. Um, and that's where the word hashtag came from. In England, the pound sign is called the hash, because it looks kind of like a, I don't know, a hash sign. And then a tag, because uh, it was tagged onto words. Um, then Twitter linked it to search. It took like two lines of code. And then it's what we know today. And it's outshined other uses of the symbol. Because remember, we used to call it the pound sign. Um, I heard of someone, someone told me their delivery guy was looking for hashtag 2A, because it used to be number. Um, so it used to mean number. It also means checkmate in chess. On Swedish maps, it means lumberyard. Um, and it comes from the Latin unit of measurement, Libra Pondo. Uh, those two words were interchangeable. You could call that unit of measurement a Libra or a Pondo, which is why the British pound is a stylized L for Libra. Um, so Libra Pondo got uh, shortened to LB, and they put a little bar connecting the L and the B. Um, you can see it over there on the right, the little LB connected. Uh, Libra Pondo, and then as scribes started writing it, they got a little hasty, and it started to look more like a pound sign. Um, that's actually the writing of Sir Isaac Newton. Um, and then as scribes kind of turned this into a, a, the hash, the pound sign, the symbol became important enough to make it onto the typewriter keyboard. And at the same time as it was entered into the typewriter keyboard and entered kind of the language of computers, the touch tone telephone was also being invented at Bell Labs. And so since it was not a rotary phone anymore, the numbers didn't have to be in a circle. And so Bell Labs played around with a few design layouts. Here are some of the designs they were considering. Um, but ultimately, they, they decided to go with that first one up there, um, three rows of three numbers with a zero all alone at the bottom. But then those touch tones presented an interesting new technology, because with rotary phones, you dial a number, and then it was connected. You couldn't dial anymore, or else you'd disrupt the connection. But with touch tone phones, suddenly now it could say, you know, for menu option, press, you know, one or two. You could keep dialing, and it wouldn't ruin the connection. And so engineers at Bell Labs knew that we'd want to navigate these automatic message system, automatic banking systems, um, and use directories over the phone, and that we'd want some keys that weren't just numbers. Ugh, can't find this mouse. Where'd it go? There it is. Um, and so they decided they wanted some keys that weren't just numbers. So they decided, hey, there are these two extra spaces in the grid on the phone key on either side of that zero. Why don't we put in a star and a diamond? And, uh, but soon, engineers realized that we'd want to use shapes that would be in a computer's vocabulary to make automation easier and hopefully one day use our phones to connect with computers. And so they chose the asterisk because it looks kind of star-like, and they chose the pound sign because it kind of looks like a diamond in the middle a little bit. It was like the closest thing they could find to a diamond. So the asterisk and the pound sign got added to the, um, to the phone key. But in using those symbols, they, they basically predicted that we would be using telephones to communicate with computers, which we ended up doing. So back in 2007, when Chris Messina wanted to use hardware to make an internet language, when he wanted to find a way to post to Twitter uh, and make sure it was phone compatible, he was using a BlackBerry. And he was using, he did, it was before iPhones. So he basically had two options if he didn't want to use numbers. He could choose the star or the pound. And he chose the pound because it's a very dense symbol that stands out. And so now it's leaped off the screen and into real life. And it's become more of a tool. It sells things, it moves conversations, it rallies people. It's become part of common parlance. But it probably won't stick around forever as computers get more advanced because the hashtag is a way of making computers understand the normal flow of human speech, 
without the, and what we want eventually one day is for computers to sort what we're saying without the need for a symbol to naturally understand our language. And when that happens, I can imagine a future in which the hashtag is completely detached from its use and drifts back into ornament or pure meaningless decoration. And in some ways we're already seeing it. So there's a question here of ornament versus tool, form versus function. And when comparing the quatrefoil and the hashtag, I guess what I'm trying to say is these boundaries can be hazy between decoration and tool. And for the sake of a long view, I'm considering all of these elements in terms of human use and cultural significance. If we are indeed thinking about designed things as a language of objects in society, some of them have a lot to say, literally. Neon. So I talked to this German professor for this story that I did about neon, and he said that it's a great metaphor for American culture, and that there's nothing quite so American as a neon sign, even though the invention itself was not made here. It's not an American invention. The English scientist Sir William Ramsey discovered the gas, but a French scientist named George Claude was the one who popularized it. He decided, once he discovered that you could, um, basically William Ramsey discovered that you could run light through neon gas in a tube and it would make this bright red glow. But he more or less said, oh, that's cool, and just kind of moved on to other stuff. But Claude Neon, um, but George Claude was the one who seized upon it and said, hey, we can sell this thing. And he turned, uh, he turned it into his business. He basically quit science and invented uh, this company called Claude Neon. And he made the first neon signs, which were in Paris. The first one was for a barber shop. And right away, it stood out. I mean, how could it not? And everyone was like, what is that? And it spread around Paris and then made its way to the US uh, via LA. It's uh, unclear, but the popular legend is that a salesman in LA uh, who ran a car dealership saw the neon signs all around Paris and said, oh my god, I got to get me one of those. Um, but once it made it to the US, it just spread like crazy. So in 1930, there were 20,000 signs in Manhattan and Brooklyn. And having a neon sign was just the peak of, of sophistication and technology. Uh, it meant the lap of luxury. It became the symbol of life in the big city. Uh, so this is Times Square in the 50s. And you can hear the neon enthusiasm of this time in the music. Like, this is a song by Peggy Lee. Let's see if it works. But the city has become unpopular as um, basically white flight wipes some of their population and resources. And so when cities become unpopular, the neon enthusiasm sort of fades. It becomes seedy. And so it becomes a sign of desperation and loneliness and this sad monument to late capitalism. And again, you can hear it in the music. And so it becomes a sign of like, yeah, loneliness, alienation. You hear it in a lot of country songs, like this one. Uh, because basically a neon sign is incredibly hard to fix. It's not like you can just, you know, um, order up a, a new one at the Home Depot. It requires a lot of craftsmanship. And so when a neon sign breaks at this period in time, it was really hard to actually go in and fix it. So they were just kind of like broken, flashing erratically. They didn't look good. And in a lot of city beautiful projects, neon signs were taken away because, yeah, a broken neon sign is a flashing sign of brokenness. Because, um, yeah, you can't just screw in a new tube. You can't just buy a replacement like a bulb because neon is a real art. And the craft of making neon is called neon tube bending. That is Shauna Peterson in Oakland. She's a master tube bender, which means that she takes elements from the air we breathe, like neon gas and argon gas, and tracks, traps them in glass tubes and runs electricity through them. It's this really labor-intensive, incredibly skilled process. She's an artist. And it's magical. And it's expensive. And so when neon breaks or flickers out, they often get replaced with video screens or LEDs like New York and Hong Kong are losing their neon signs. So this is Times Square today. If you look around, it's all screens and LEDs. And you know, arguably, like, why should we keep them around? Why would one maintain a cool vintage sign that's not for their business? It's expensive. Um, so that makes it more art than signage. So indeed, neon has become more of an art. Now it represents craftsmanship and style tinged with a little bit of nostalgia. And so because it's become this kind of precious art commodity, it's moved indoors into interiors of shops and offices and businesses. 
like this is a sign Shauna did for the North Face. It's a, the story in San Francisco. Uh, most of Shauna's clients are corporate chains now or uh, offices. This is the art department at Airbnb uh, at their headquarters. And so this all might sound kind of like precious and artisanal or whatever, but it's the way that this craft might survive into its next life, wherever it drifts. And so there's this dialectic of how we access these design elements and repurpose them. Like, do they shape us or do we shape them? Well, I mean, they're inanimate. Humans shape them. We shape them. But it happens over a period of time. And these objects and symbols are in dialogue with humans of the past and humans of the future as we build and redefine our collective knowledge. Because the drift of objects directly affects the way we relate to one another and the cities around us. In the example of neon, changes in use evidences changing populations in the city, which changes the suburbs, changes race dynamics, economic systems, public transit accessibility, everything. And so now neon is back, and so is urban life, and this idea of craftsmanship and authenticity. And who knows, maybe neon will just rust and flicker out again. But even if so, that's not necessarily the end of the story. Because cities, like living things, evolve slowly over time. Elements get added and removed, and some things get left behind. Like there are these little vestigial parts of cities, like how humans still have tail bones, even though we don't have tails anymore, or how whales have pelvises, even though they don't have legs anymore. Cities, similarly, have stairs that lead to nowhere, telephone poles without wiring, and neon signs that don't light up. There's an example. Usually these architectural elements crumble or get removed, but sometimes they stay and sometimes they get maintained. So see, that's where stairs used to lead up there and now it's just a door that doesn't go anywhere. So it's a, it's a useless door, uh, but it's still maintained. See, there are like plants on it and they've kept it up. So um, that's the same with this nice fence over there that doesn't actually fence in anything. Um, so, in 1972, a Japanese artist named Akasagawa Genpei was taking a walk on his lunch break, and he found a stairway that led to nowhere, and it had been repaired, and he was intrigued. So he noticed more, of the, more and more of these useless yet maintained vestiges of the city, especially in Japan in the aftermath of World War II, uh, because so much had been rebuilt so quickly. And so he would take pictures of these sorts of elements and he would publish them in a magazine and readers would send in ones that they found. And Akasagawa would evaluate these submissions and determine if the thing was both completely purposeless and still maintained. And if it met those two criteria of complete purposelessness and maintenance, then he would call it a Thomason. Named for Gary Thomason, who played for the LA Dodgers and the SF Giants. And then he was snatched up by the Yomiuri Giants, who were basically like the Yankees of Tokyo. They were a big, fancy team, had a lot of money. But once he got to Japan, Gary Thomason lost his stride. He could not hit a Japanese pitcher for the life of him. He hit, actually, the all-time strikeout record. And it's really mean, actually. Japanese, uh, the Japanese uh, baseball fans called him the human fan for swinging the bat around and only moving the air. Um, so he ended up just kind of like sitting out the, sitting on the bench for the rest of his career, just for the rest of his contract, just collecting money. They didn't really put him in. So he was a useless player who was still maintained. It's kind of mean. Uh, although Akasagawa was actually a huge Yomiuri Giants fan, and he kind of meant this name to be endearing, endearing because the concept is cool. Uh, there's a potential for all designs to become Thomasons and in that sense, find new purpose in their purposelessness. I've seen quatrefoils repainted, I've, been, I've seen quatrefoils painted on abandoned buildings in Cuba so that they are still serving their purpose as an ornament even though the building isn't there anymore. And hashtags are still on touch-tone phones even though people don't really use them in that same way. Um, and now, you know, the neon signs that have been fixed but have no electricity running through them are also Thomasons in their own way. Um, neon signs are literal signs of drift. And here are a few Thomason neon signs that Randall and Al have taken pictures of all over San Francisco. And some of these are landmarks, which makes you wonder, does that make it not a Thomason? Is being a landmark a way of serving a purpose? Does that really count? 
It's an interesting thing to try to debate when something is truly purposeless. Um, either way, these signs are proof that the painstaking works of art and design that we erect will go through ebbs and flows. Just as we, in the course of our lives, will be loved, hated, in style, out of style, and constantly, constantly made to adapt. Thanks. <laughs>